Hello everyone and welcome to the channel, I'm Emmanuel, I'm an Airbus pilot and in today's video let's talk about how much fuel you usually have in your tanks on arrival. Now, we are talking standard fuel policies over here and a little bit of extra, but let's start with a standard. So by EASA standards you are carrying 5% contingency fuel, but at least 5 minutes, or you are carrying 3% or 20 minutes. There are a couple of other reduced contingency fuel schemes as well, but contingency fuel is what you will have. Then you have alternate fuel, which is the fuel to conduct a missed approach at your destination and then fly along a previously filed route to your alternate airport. And then there is final reserve, which is usually 30 minutes holding at 1500 feet above your destination aerodrome. Now, those three values are what are typically on board the plane on scheduled arrival, but there is more to it. So when you actually conduct a flight, you typically get shortcuts and thereby use less trip fuel. You might be able to fly at a more optimum altitude than what's been previously planned, etc. So all of that gives you a little bit of extra. Now let's have a quick look into the number that we got on our current flight. So on our current way to Palma de Mallorca, we end up with 300 kilograms of extra fuel, which the FMS tells us equals 8 minutes. Now, that is a typical amount of fuel that a normal passenger flight in good weather conditions would carry when arriving at the destination. So now we've got the ultimate fuel, we got the fuel for our final reserves, and then we got this amount. Now, what you will notice on a flight like this is 300 kilos equals roughly the amount of the contingency fuel. And on top of that, we will also have a little bit more what we save from direct along our route, etc. Now, let's talk about what we can do with this amount of fuel. Now, obviously, there is first of all one big thing here. That's our ordinal fuel, 2.2 tons. So if this amount of fuel down here is about to be burned up, so like this we would have 9 minutes of holding available and thereafter we would have to start our approach or divert to the alternate. But if the weather conditions at the destination aerodrome are good and the commander has reason to believe that a landing at the destination aerodrome is assured, you might just skip the alternate airport, remove that and then your extra increases drastically. Have a look at that. If I'm removing the Alton from my flight plan, all of a sudden I have fuel for 1 hour and 15 minutes. And that is quite a lot of fuel. Now, this obviously is only done under certain circumstances. Say you need, for example, to have good weather conditions at your destination. You need to have more than one runway so that in case something goes wrong and the runway you plan to land on gets blocked, you also have the other runway available. So you basically need to have a valid plan B at all times. And then we need to ask ourselves, do threats exist at the destination or do no threats exist at the destination? If no threats exist, then you can go down to final reserve fuel when you commit for landing. Basically 30 minutes of flight time need to be available if no threats exist at the valid plan B. Note the valid plan B can very well just be the other runway on the airport that you're flying to anyway. So that is a valid plan B in case you've got good conditions as I've just described. Obviously the traffic situation also needs to permit it. You would not commit to land at a destination where you've got so much traffic that nobody knows how long you're going to go into the holding. But if threats do exist then you need at least 45 minutes of fuel. And those 45 minutes, if you think about it, are not a lot. So that is really something the commander needs to pay careful attention to. Let's assume the following situation. We arrive at our destination, we need to go around for whatever reason and then conduct a second approach. Now, how much fuel are we going to use for that? Well, a typical go-around in a 737NG or an Airbus A320 is going to consume somewhere between 600 and 800 kilograms of fuel. Now, 6 to 800 kilograms normally equals approximately 15 minutes flight time. So you can say 
five minutes fly time in an A320 or a 737 is roughly 200 kilograms of fuel. Now, therefore, 15 minutes fuel, 600 kilograms. So let's have a look at this practical example over here. Now, we have no reason to believe that we are going to encounter delay whatsoever. Therefore, flying with the amount of um, extra fuel that we have here is pretty much the standard that any airline would do. And if the pilot wants to take extra fuel, he should have a good reason for it. Now, that doesn't mean that your airline is going to fire you for taking extra fuel as long as you've got a reason. And indeed, many airlines don't even care at all how much fuel their commanders take along. Now, every airline is going to be different. I used to be in an airline where you would have to write down the reason for extra fuel any time you took any, even though that reason was accepted without any issues on every single one flight I did. So you could take extra fuel, you just had to give a reason for it. Or then there is my new airline as a complete opposite, where we can just take whatever we want without any questions being asked. Now, obviously, if you would take 10 tons extra fuel, which in the A330 is roughly an hour and a half, a little bit more than that, if you took 10 tons of extra fuel when you're approaching an airport with free runways, no traffic, and good weather conditions, obviously, somebody might start asking a question at some point. But, in general, when you are arriving with the standard fuel like we are right now, you are around about... Um, 10 to 15 minutes of extra on board when arriving at your destination on top of the final reserve and alternate fuel. So that is always what you need to keep in mind when we're talking about this extra, when we say we have 9 minutes extra, that means 9 minutes on top of the fuel you need to divert to your alternate. Now, 9 minutes is a lot of time. That is 2 rounds in a hold or that is, well, delay vectors for 9 minutes. So that is quite a bit of fuel. And as you can see in good weather conditions like we have them at our destination right now if we really needed to enter hold if shit would hit the fan then we could at any time just commit to landing at our destination get rid of that alternate fuel and all of a sudden we're looking at an extra of an hour and 15 minutes in this case now committing to landing at your destination and getting rid of the alternate fuel is usually going to give you something somewhere in the region of roughly 45 minutes of additional fuel to land at your destination. The reason for that is that the fuel to divert to your alternate is calculated to take into account a missed approach at your original destination and then fly to your alternate and conduct a standard approach over there. So you actually got quite a bit more fuel than if you were to divert to your destination straight away. But let's take a quick look at an example of some decision making on an approach like this. So let's just add the alternate fuel back in. Now we've got 2.2 tons of alternate fuel and that gives us back our 9 minutes of extra. Now we are to conduct an approach at our destination and we need to go around, let's say because the preceding aircraft did not vacate the runway. Now we conduct our go around and now our traffic control is going to usually vector you straight back onto a downwind for a second approach. My experience with all of the uh, go-arounds I've done so far, not many, I believe five or six maybe, but my experience with that is that every time we were put straight back into the sequence and we were always being uh, prioritized by our traffic control thereafter because ATC knows round about how much fuel you will have on a standard approach like this. So they give priority to a second approach of yours over putting you back at the end of the sequence. Now, nonetheless, you all of a sudden end up burning the extra fuel that we had down here very quickly. We say we've got 300 kilos over here. Now, you burn that and all of a sudden you are right down to your final reserve plus your alternate. So you've got to make a decision to whether to divert or not very quickly. For this reason, it is always a good idea to just look ahead in your descent planning and maybe look over into the flight path to your Altland aerodrome. Is there any returns on the weather radar? Is there anything that might give you an idea that you might use more fuel than planned for your diversion? Now, usually that is a decision that will turn out in the negative, but it is definitely something you should do on your descents and on your approaches. Now. The time to actually decide whether you want to commit to landing at your destination after a missed approach 
or whether to conduct the mist approach can be very sparse. It can be down to just a matter of minutes. And now imagine that you decide to divert to your alternate, but due to some reasons that were not foreseeable on the ground, air traffic control cannot offer you the direct routing that you originally planned for. In the real life, when you divert to an alternate, usually you are just going to get a radar vector out of the immediate vicinity of the aerodrome at which you attempted your original landing, and then you will just get it direct to the final approach fix, or radar vectors to round about that same direction. Air traffic control really tries to facilitate diversions as good as they can. However, we need to keep in mind that there are occasions, say because there might be bad weather between you and your alternate, or any other reason like active military areas that were not foreseen to be active during your original flight planning, all of that is obviously going to cause you to use more fuel and therefore something you should anticipate happening. Now in any case, if you do happen to end up with an indication that you might start using your final reserve fuel, then as long as you can make it without using final reserve, a minimum fuel call would be appropriate. Of course, if you do happen to arrive with an amount of fuel that would otherwise, um, if there is any further delay encountered, lead to the usage of final reserve fuel. And if you actually show to be arriving within the amount of final reserve fuel that's been uh, planned, then a fuel mayday call would absolutely be appropriate. Now the reason I'm saying all of this is that I want to raise awareness for the actual fuel quantities that you're going to arrive with on your destination. Now, let's have a quick look into how much fuel I loaded up for this flight. So, if we go over to the mass and balance page, you can see I loaded 8,200 kilograms of fuel. If you now have a look into the flight planning, then you can see that we need roughly 8,100 and a bit in order to actually make the flight. So I just rounded it up to the next 100, which is what airlines would normally want their pilots to do in good weather conditions like those that you can see over here. Cavalcade in the forecast, calm winds, so nothing to worry about at all. Likewise for our alternates, Cavalcade, calm winds, so absolutely no reason to take any extra fuel under these conditions. But, always remember what that is going to put you into. Many flight simulators just tend to take the same brief amount of fuel, which the uh, Phoenix, the PNDG and others so uh, luckily happen to load straight into the uh, planned amount of fuel, and they take it down to the kilo. Now. Had I taken this one down to the kilo, I would now not have 300 kilos extra, but probably 200, which would only be 5 minutes of time available. And like that, if you just take that tiny bit more, it is certainly going to give you a lot more flexibility when something actually happens. And we are just talking about tiny things here, like for example a delay vector of a couple minutes, because our traffic control can't do proper separation, like those 90 degrees off vectors that they do love to give you at Batson, for example. So, as you can see, the amount of fuel that you carry when arriving at your destination is certainly a topic that is worth thinking about and a topic that is definitely worth dealing with during the early stages of planning your approach. How much do you have, aka how much time do you have? We never talk in fuel in form of kilos or pounds, but always in form of time that it actually gives you. So how much fuel aka time do you have, what options does that give you and how quickly do you have to make a decision whether you want to divert. Let's just look at one more scenario in order to finish this one up. When you're flying into an area where you have bad weather in the area, then you probably are arriving with some 15 or 30 minutes of extra fuel. But let's say that you go around due to thunderstorms you make that go around using the wind shear escape maneuver, which is going to keep the drag devices, aka flaps and landing gear out for much longer. You also run the engines at a higher power setting. So all of that uses extra fuel and all of a sudden you are below the amount of minimum fuel if you didn't take any extra. Now, let's say that you do such a go around because of um, an unstabilized approach due to tailwind. We don't need to necessarily talk about wind shear here, because with wind shear you'd probably not even attempt a second approach unless you have 
good indications that the second approach would be successful. So let's say that you got thunderstorms and due to tailwind you can't reduce your speed, you're unstable through the gate, you go around because of that, you fly the missed approach and now you've got to make a decision. Now making that decision is going to take time. At least you might want to get the weather information for your alternate airports and therefore decide which alternate you actually want to divert towards. If you need to listen to the ADIS that might easily take five minutes if you want to catch two or three different options. Now if you've got data link then it might also take a minute or two for all of that information to become available. So consider that when you are planning your extra fuel with bad weather conditions ahead. Now with all of that I would like to say thank you very much for watching. I hope that you appreciated this little insight there and as always if you did be sure to let me know in the comments below and if you're up for more don't forget to subscribe to the channel. With all of that I'd like to say thank you very much for watching and as always if you really love what I'm doing I would appreciate a small donation through the buy me coffee link in the video description below. Thank you for watching and see you all again on the next one.